Overdrawn at the Memory Bank by John Barr. It was a school day at the Kenya Disneyland. Five nine-year-olds were being shown around the Medico station where Fingal lay on the recording table, the top of his skull removed, looking up into a mirror. Fingal was in a bad mood, hence the trip to the Disneyland, and could have done without the children. Their teacher was doing his best, but who could control five nine-year-olds? What's the big green wire do, teacher? asked a little girl, reaching out one grubby hand and touching Fingal's brain where the main recording wire clamped into the built-in terminal. Lupus, I told you not to touch anything. And look at you, you didn't even wash your hands. The teacher took the child's hand and pulled it away. But what does it matter? You told us yesterday that the reason no one cares about dirt like they used to is dirt isn't dirty anymore. I'm sure I didn't tell you exactly that. What I said was that when humans were forced off Earth, we took the golden opportunity to wipe out all harmful germs. When there were only 3,000 people alive on the moon after the occupation, it was easy for us to sterilize everything. So the Medico doesn't need to wear gloves like surgeons used to, or even wash your hands. There's no danger of infection, but it isn't polite. We don't want this man to think we're being impolite to him just because his nervous system is disconnected and he can't do anything about it, do we? No, teacher. What's a surgeon? What's infection? Fingal wished the little perishers had chosen another day for their lesson, but as the teacher had said, there was very little he could do. The medico had turned his motor control over to the computer while she took the reading. He was paralyzed. He eyed the little boy, carrying the carved stick. He hoped he didn't get the notion to poke him in the cerebellum with it. Fingal was insured, but who needs the trouble? All of you stand back so the medico can do her work. That's better. Now, who can tell me what the big green wire is? Destry? Destry allowed as how he didn't know, didn't care, and wished he could get out of here and play spatball. The teacher dismissed him, and he went on with the others. The green wire is the main sounding electrode, the teacher said. It's attached to a series of very fine wires in the man's head, like the ones you have, which are implanted at birth. Can anyone tell me how the recording is made? The little girl with the dirty hands spoke up. By tying knots in string. The teacher laughed, but the medico didn't. She had heard it all before. So had the teacher, of course, but that was why he was a teacher. He had the patience to deal with children, a rare quality now that there were so few of them. No, that was just an analogy. Can you all say analogy? Analogy, they chorused. Fine. What I told you is that the chains of FPNA are very much like strings with knots tied in them. If you make a code with every millimeter and every knot having a meaning, you can write words in string by tying knots in it. That's what the machine does with the FPNA. Can anyone tell me what FPNA stands for? Ferrophotonucleic acid, said the girl, who seemed to be the star pupil. That's right, Lupus. It's a variant on DNA, and it can be knotted by magnetic fields and light and made to go through chemical changes. What the Medico is doing now is threading long strands of FPNA into the tiny tubes that are in the man's brain. When she's done, she'll switch on the machine and the current will start tying knots. And what happens then? All his memories go into the memory cube, said Lupus. That's right but it's a little more complicated than that. You remember what I told you about a divided cipher? The kind that has two parts, neither of which is any good without the other? Imagine two of the strings, each of which with a lot of knots in them. Well, you try to read one of them with your decoder, and you find out that it doesn't make sense. That's because whoever wrote it used two strings with knots tied in different places. They only make sense when you put them side by side and read them that way. That's how this decoder works but the Medico is using 25 strings. When they're all knotted in the right way and put in the right openings in the cube over there, he pointed to the pink cube on the Medico's bench, they'll contain all this man's memories and personality. In a way, he'll be in the cube, but he won't know it, because he's going to be an African lion today. This excited the children, 
who would much rather be stalking the Kenya savanna than listening to how Multi Hollow was taken. When they quieted down, the teacher went on, using analogies that got more strained by the minute. When the strings are in class, pay attention. When they're in the cube, a current sets them in place. What we have then is a multi hollow. Can anyone tell me why we can't just take a tape recording of what's going on in the man's brain and use that? One of the boys answered for once. Because memory isn't. what's the word? Sequential? Yeah, that's it. His memories are stashed all over his brain, and there's no way to sort them out. So this recorder takes a picture of the whole thing at once. Like a hologram. Does that mean you can cut the cube in half and have two people? No, but that's a good question. This isn't that sort of hologram. This is something like... Like when you press your hand into clay, but in four dimensions. If you chip off a part of the clay after it's dried, you lose part of the information, right? Well, this is sort of like that. You can't see the imprint because it's too small, but everything the man ever did and saw and heard and thought will be in the cube. Would you move back a little? asked the medico. The children in the mirror over Fingal's head shuffled back and became more than just heads with shoulders sticking out. The medico adjusted the last strand of FPNA suspended in Fingal's cortex to the close tolerances specified by the computer. I'd like to be a medico when I grow up, said one boy. I thought you wanted to go to college and study to be a scientist. Well, maybe, but my friend is teaching me to be a medico. It looks a lot easier. You should stay in school, Destry. I'm sure your parent would want you to make something of yourself. The medico fumed silently. She knew better than to speak up. Education was a serious business, and interference with the duties of a teacher carried a stiff fine. But she was obviously pleased when the class thanked her and went out the door leaving dirty footprints behind them. She viciously flipped a switch, and Fingal found he could breathe and move the muscles in his head. Lousy conceited college graduate, she said. What the hell's wrong with getting your hands dirty, I ask you? She wiped the blood from her hands onto her blue smock. Teachers are the worst, Fingal said. Ain't it the truth? Well, being a medico is nothing to be ashamed of. So I didn't go to college, so what? I can do my job. And I can see what I'm done when I'm through. I always did like working with my hands. Did you know that being a medico used to be one of the most respected professions there was? Really? Fact. They had to go to college for years and years. And they made a hell of a lot of money, let me tell you. Fingal said nothing, thinking she may be exaggerating. What was so tough about medicine? Just a little mechanical sense and a steady hand? That was all you needed. Fingal did a lot of maintenance on his body himself going to the shop only for major work, and a good thing at the prices they charged. It was not the sort of thing one discussed while laying helpless on the table, however. Okay, it's done. She pulled out the modules that contained the invisible FPNA and set them into the developing solution. She fastened Fingal's skull back on and tightened the recessed screws set into the bone. She turned his motor control back over to him while he sealed his scalp back into place. He stretched and yawned. He always grew sleepy in the medico's shop. He didn't know why. Will that be all for today, sir? We've got a special on blood changes. And since you'll just be lying there while you're out doppling in the park, you might as well... No thanks. I had it changed a year ago. Didn't you read my history? She picked up the card and glanced at it. So you did. Fine. You can get up now, Mr. Fingal. She made a note on the card and set it down on the table. The door opened and a small face peered in. I left my stick, said the boy. He came in and started looking under things, to the annoyance of the medico. She attempted to ignore the boy as she took down the rest of the information she needed. Are you going to experience this holiday now, or wait until your double has finished and play it back then? Huh? Oh, you mean... Yes, I see. No, I'll go right into the animal. My psychist advised me to come out here for my nerves, so it wouldn't do me much good to wait it out, would it? No, I suppose it wouldn't. So you'll be sleeping here while your doppel is in the park. Hey! She turned to confront the little boy who was poking his nose into things he should stay away from. She grabbed him and pulled him away. You either find what you're looking for in one minute or you get out of here, you see? He went back to his searching, giggling behind his hand and looking for more interesting things to fool around with.
The medico made a check on the card, glanced at the glowing numbers on her thumbnail, and discovered her shift was almost over. She connected the memory cube through the machine to a terminal in the back of Fingal's head. You've never done this before, right? We do this to avoid blank spots, which can be confusing sometimes. The cube is almost set, but now I'll add the last ten minutes to the record at the time I put you to sleep. That way you'll experience no disorientation. You'll move through a dream state to full awareness of being in the body of a lion. Your body will be removed and taken to one of our slumber rooms while you're gone. There's nothing to worry about. Fingal wasn't worried, just tired and tense. He wished she would go on and do it and stop talking about it, and he wished the little boy would stop prodding his stick against the table leg. He wondered if his headache would be transferred to the lion. She turned him off. They hauled his body away and took his memory cube to the installation room. The medico chased the boy into the corridor and hosed down the recording room. Then she was off to a date she was already late for. The employees of Kenya Disneyland installed the cube into a metal box set into the skull of a full-grown African lioness. The social structure of lions being what it was, the proprietors charged a premium for the use of a male body, but Fingal didn't care one way or the other. A short ride in an underground railroad with the sedated body of the Fingal lioness, and he was deposited beneath the blazing sun of the Kenya savanna. He awoke, sniffed the air, and felt bitter immediately. The Kenya Disneyland was a total environment buried 20 kilometers beneath Mare Moscovitz in the far side of Luna. It was roughly circular, with a radius of 200 kilometers. From the ground to the sky was 2 kilometers except over the full-sized replica of Kilimanjaro, where it bulged to allow clouds to form in a realistic manner over the snow cap. The illusion was flawless. The curve of the ground was consistent with the curvature of the earth, so that the horizon was much more distant than anything Fingal was used to. The trees were real, and so were the animals. At night, an astronomer would have needed a spectroscope to distinguish the stars from the real thing. Fingal certainly couldn't spot anything wrong, not that he wanted to. The colors were strange, but that was from the limitations of feline optics. Sounds were much more vivid, as were smells. If he'd thought about it, he would have realized the gravity was much too weak for Kenya. But he wasn't thinking. He'd come here to avoid that. It was hot and glorious. The dry grass made no sound as he walked over on broad pads. He smelled antelope, wildebeest, and... Was that baboon? He felt pangs of hunger, but he really didn't want to hunt. But he found the lioness body starting on a stalk anyway. Fingal was in an odd position. He was in control of the lioness, but only more or less. He could guide her where he wanted to go, but he had no say at all over instinctive behaviors. He was as much a pawn to these as the lioness was. In one sense, he was the lioness. When he wished to raise a paw or turn around, he simply did. The motor control was complete. It felt great to walk on all fours, and it came as easily as breathing. But the scent of the antelope went on a direct route from the nostrils to the lower brain, made a connection with the rumblings of hunger, and started him on the stalk. The guidebook said to surrender to it. Fighting it wouldn't do anyone any good, and could frustrate you. If you were paying to be a lion, read the chapter on Things to Do. You might as well be one, not just wear the body and see the sights. Fingal wasn't sure he liked this as he came downwind of the antelope and crouched behind a withered clump of scrub. He pondered it while he sized up a dozen or so animals grazing just a few meters from him, picking out the small, the weak, and the young with a predator's eye. Maybe he should back out now and go on his way. These beautiful creatures were not harming him. The Fingal part of him wished mostly to admire them, not eat them. Before he knew what had happened, he was standing triumphant over the body of a small antelope. The others were just dusty trails in the distance. It had been incredible. The lioness was fast, but might as well have been moving in slow motion compared to the antelope. Her only advantage lay in surprise, confusion, and quick all-out attack. There had been a lifting of the head, ears had flicked toward the brush he was hiding in, and he had exploded. Ten seconds of furious exertion, and he bit down on the soft throat, felt the blood gush and the dying kicks of the hind legs under his paws. He was breathing hard, and the blood coursed through his veins. There was only one way to release the tension. 
he threw his head back and roared his bloodlust. He had had it with lions at the end of the weekend. It wasn't worth it for the few minutes of exhilaration at the kill. It was a life of endless stalking, countless failures, then a pitiful struggle to get a few bites for yourself from the kill you had made. He found to his chagrin that his lioness was very low in the dominance order. When he got his kill back to the pride, he didn't know why he had dragged it back, but the lioness seemed to know, it was promptly stolen from him. He, she, sat back helplessly and watched the dominant male take his share, followed by the rest of the pride. He was left with a dried haunch four hours later, and had to contest even that with vultures and hyenas. He saw what the premium payment was for, that male had it easy. But he had to admit that it had been worth it. He felt better. His psychist had been right. It did one good to leave the insatiable computers at his office for a weekend of simple living. There were no complicated choices to be made out here. If he was in doubt, he listened to his instincts. It was just that next time, he'd go as an elephant. He'd been watching them. All the other animals pretty much left them alone, and he could see why. To be a solitary bull, free to wander where he wished, with food as close as the nearest tree branch? He was still thinking about it when the collection crew came for him. He awoke with a vague feeling that something was wrong. He sat up in bed and looked around him. Nothing seemed to be out of place. There was no one in the room with him. He shook his head to clear it. It didn't do any good. There was still something wrong. He tried to remember how he had gotten there and laughed at himself. His own bedroom. What was so remarkable about that? But hadn't there been a vacation? A weekend trip? He remembered being a lion, eating raw antelope meat, being pushed around within the pride, fighting it out with the other females, and losing, and retiring to rumble to him herself. Certainly he should have come back to human consciousness in the Disneyland medical station. He couldn't remember it. He reached for his phone, not knowing who he wished to call, his psychist perhaps, or the Kenya office. I'm sorry, Mr. Fingal, the phone told him. This line is no longer available for outgoing calls. If you'll... Why not? he asked, irritated and confused. I paid my bill. That is of no concern to this department, Mr. Fingal. And please do not interrupt. It's hard enough to reach you. I'm fading, but the message will be continued if you look to your right. The voice and the power hum behind it faded. The phone was dead. Fingal looked to his right and jerked in surprise. There was a hand, a woman's hand, writing on his wall. The hand faded out at the wrist. Mine, mine, it wrote, in thin letters of fire. Then the hand waved in irritation and erased it with its thumb. The wall was smudged with soot where the words had been. You're projecting, Mr. Fingal, the hand wrote, quickly etching out the words with a manicured nail. That's what you expected to see. The hand underlined the word expected three times. Please cooperate, clear your mind, and see what is there, or we're not going to get anywhere. Damn, I've about exhausted this medium. And indeed it had. The writing had filled the wall, and the hand was now down near the floor. The apparition wrote smaller and smaller in an effort to get it all in. Fingal had an excellent grasp on reality, according to his psychist. He held tightly on to that evaluation like a talisman as he leaned closer to the wall and read the last sentence. Look on your bookshelf, the hand wrote. The title is Orientation in Your Fantasy World. Fingal knew he had no such book, but could think of nothing better to do. His phone didn't work, and if he was going through a psychotic episode, he didn't think it wise to enter the public corridor until he had some idea of what was going on. The hand faded out, but the writing continued to smolder. He found the book easily enough. It was a pamphlet, actually, with a gaudy cover. It was the sort of thing he had seen in the outer offices of the Kenya Disneyland, a promotional booklet. At the bottom it said, Published under the auspices of the Kenya Computer, A. Jochum Operator. He opened it and began to read. Chapter 1. Where am I? You're probably wondering by now where you are. This is an entirely healthy and normal reaction, Mr. Fingal. Anyone would wonder when possessed by what appear to be paranormal manifestations if his grasp on reality had weakened, or, in simple language, my nuts are what? 
No, Mr. Fingal, you are not nuts. But you are not, as you probably think, sitting on your bed reading a book. It's all in your mind. You are still in the Kenya Disneyland. More specifically, you are contained in the memory cube we took of you before your weekend on the savannah. You see, there's been a big goof up. Chapter 2 What happened? We'd like to know that too, Mr. Fingal. But here's what we do know. Your body has been misplaced. Now there's nothing to worry about. We are doing all we can to locate it and find out how it happened. But it will take some time. Maybe it's small consolation, but this has never happened before in the 75 years we've been operating. And as soon as we find out how it happened this time, you can be sure we'll be careful not to let it happen again. We are pursuing several leads at the time, and you can rest easy that your body will be returned to you intact just as soon as we locate it. You are awake and aware right now because we have incorporated your memory cube into the workings of our H210 computer, one of the finest hollow memory systems available to modern business. You see, there are a few problems. Chapter 3 What problems? It's kind of hard to put in terms you'd understand, but let's take a crack at it, shall we? The medium we use to record your memories isn't the one you probably used yourself as insurance against accidental death. As you must know, that system will store your memories for up to 20 years with no degradation or loss of information, and is quite expensive. The system we use is a temporary one, good for 2, 5, 14, or 28 days depending on the length of your stay. Your memories are put in the cube, where you might expect to remain static and unchanged, as they do in your insurance recording. If you thought that, you would be wrong, Mr. Fingal. Think about it. If you die, your bank will immediately start a clone from the plasm you stored along with the memory cube. In six months, your memories would be played back to the clone and you would awaken, missing the memories that were accumulated in your body from the time of your last recording. Perhaps this has happened to you. If it has, you know the shock of awakening from a recorded process to be told that it is three or four years later and that you had died in that time. In any case, the process we use is an ongoing one, or it would be worthless to you. The cube we install in the African animal of your choice is capable of adding the memories of your stay in Kenya to the memory cube. When your visit is over, these memories are played back into your brain, and you leave the Disneyland with the exciting, educational, and refreshing experiences you had as an animal, though your body never left our slumber room. This is known as Doppling, from the German Doppelganger. Now, to the problems we talked about. Thought we'd never get around to them, didn't you? First, since you registered for a weekend stay, the Medico naturally used one of the two-day cubes as part of your budget excursion fare. These cubes have a safety factor that aren't much good beyond three days at best. At the end of the time, the cube would start to deteriorate. Of course, we fully expect to have you installed in your own body before then. Additionally, there is the problem of storage. Since these ongoing memory cubes are intended to be in use all the time, your memories are stored in them. It presents certain problems when we find ourselves in the spot we are now in. Are you following me, Mr. Fingal? While the cube has already passed its potency for use in coexisting with a live host like the lioness you just left, it must be kept in constant activation at all times or loss of information results. I'm sure you wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Of course not. So what we have done is to plug you in to our computer, which will keep you awake and healthy and guard against the randomizing of your memory next eye. I won't go into that. Let it stand that randomizing is not the sort of thing you'd like to have happen to you. Chapter 4 So what gives, huh? I'm glad you asked that, because you did ask that, Mr. Fingal. This booklet is part of the analogizing process that I'll explain further down the page. Life in a computer is not the sort of thing you could just jump into and hope to retain the world picture compatibility so necessary for sane functioning in this complex society. This has been tried, so take our word for it, or rather my word. Did I introduce myself? I am Apollonia Jochen, first class operative of the DataSafe computer troubleshooting firm. You probably heard of us, even though you did not work with computers. Since you can't just become aware in the baffling on-and-off world that passes for reality in the data system, 
Your mind, in cooperation with an analogizing program I've given the computer, interprets things in ways that seem safe and comfortable to it. The world you see around you is a figment of your imagination. Of course, it looks real to you because it comes from the same part of the mind that you normally use to interpret reality. If we wanted to get philosophical about it, we could probably argue all day about what constitutes reality and why the one you are perceiving now is any less real than the one you are used to. But let's not get into that, alright? The world will likely continue to function in ways you are accustomed for it to function. It won't be exactly the same. Nightmares, for instance. Mr. Fingal, I hope you aren't the nervous type, because your nightmares can come to life where you are. They'll seem quite real. You should avoid them if you can, because they can do you real harm. I'll say more about this later if I need to. For now, there's no need to worry. Chapter 5 What do I do now? I'd advise you to continue with your normal activities. Don't be alarmed at anything unusual. For one thing, I can only communicate with you by means of paranormal phenomena. You see, when a message from me is fed into the computer, it reaches you in a way your brain is not capable of dealing with. Naturally, your brain classifies this as an unusual event, and fleshes the communication out in unusual fashion. Most of the weird things you see, if you stay calm and don't let your own fears out of the closet to persecute you, will be me. Otherwise, I anticipate that your world should look, feel, taste, sound, and smell pretty normal. I've talked to your psychist. He assures me that your world grasp is strong, so sit tight and we'll be working hard to get you out of there. Chapter 6 Help! Yes, we'll help you. This is a truly unfortunate thing to have happened. And of course, we will refund all your money promptly. In addition, the lawyer for Kenya wants me to ask you if a lump sum settlement against all future damages is a topic worthy of discussion. You can think about it. There is no hurry. In the meantime, I'll find ways to answer your questions. It might become unwieldy the harder your mind struggles to normalize my communications into things you are familiar with. That is both your greatest strength, the ability of your mind to bend the computer world it doesn't wish to see into media you are familiar with, and my biggest handicap. Look for me in tea leaves, on billboards, on holovision, anywhere. It could be exciting if you get into it. Meanwhile, if you have received this message, you can talk to me by filling out the attached coupon by dropping it in the mail tube. Your reply will probably be waiting for you back at the office. Good luck! Yes, I received your message and am interested in the exciting opportunities in the field of computer living. Please send me, without cost or obligation, your exciting catalog telling me how I can move up to the big, wonderful world outside. Name. Address. ID. Fingal fought the urge to pinch himself. If what this booklet said was true, and he might as well believe it, it would hurt and he would not wake up. He pinched himself anyway. It hurt. If he understood this right, everything around him was the product of his imagination. Somewhere, a woman was sitting at a computer input and talking to him in normal language, which came to his brain in the form of electron pulses it could not cope with, and so edited into forms he was conversant with. He was analogizing like mad. He wondered if he had caught it from the teacher, if analogies were contagious. What the hell's wrong with a simple voice from the air? He wondered aloud. He got no response and was rather glad. He'd had enough mysteriousness for now, and on second thought, a voice from the air would probably scare the pants off him. He decided his brain must know what it was doing. After all, the hand startled him, but he hadn't panicked. He could see it, and he trusted his visual sense more than he did voices from the air. A classical sign of insanity, if ever there was one. He got up and went to the wall. The letters of fire were gone, but the black smudge of the eraser was still there. He sniffed it. Carbon. He fingered the rough paper of the pamphlet, tore off a corner, put it in his mouth, and chewed it. It tasted like paper. He sat down and filled out the coupon and tossed it into the mail tube. Fingal didn't get angry about it until he was at his office. He was an easygoing person, slow to boil, but he finally reached a point where he had to say something. 
Everything had been so normal he wanted to laugh. All his friends and acquaintances were there, doing exactly what he would have expected them to be doing. What amazed and bemused him was the number and variety of spear carriers, minor players in this internal soap opera. The extras that his mind had cooked up to people the crowded corridors, like the man he didn't recognize who had bumped into him on the tube to work, apologized and disappeared, presumably back to the bowels of his imagination. There was nothing he could do to vent his anger but test the whole absurd setup. There was a doubt lingering in his mind that the whole morning had been a fugue, a temporary lapse into dreamland. Maybe he'd never gone to Kenya after all, and his mind was playing trips on him. To get him there or keep him away? He didn't know, but he could worry about that if the test failed. He stood up at his desk terminal, which was in the third column of the fifteenth row of other identical desks, each with its diligent worker. He held up his hands and whistled. Everyone looked up. I don't believe in you, he screeched. He picked up a stack of tapes on his desk and hurled them at Felicia Nam at the desk next to his. Felicia was a good friend of his, and she registered the proper shock until the tapes hit her. Then she melted. He looked around the room and saw that everything had stopped, like a freeze frame in a motion picture. He sat down and drummed his fingers on the desktop. His heart was pounding and his face was flushed. For an awful moment, he had thought that he was wrong. He began to calm down, glancing up every few seconds to be sure the world really had stopped. In three minutes, he was in a cold sweat. What the hell had he proved? That this morning had been for real? Or that he really was crazy? It dawned on him that he would never have been able to test the assumptions under which he lived. A line of print flashed across the terminal. But when could you ever do so, Mr. Fingal? Miss Jochum, he shouted, looking around him. Where are you? I'm afraid. You mustn't be, the terminal printed. Calm yourself. You have a strong sense of reality, remember? Think about this. Even before today, how could you have been sure the world you saw was not the result of catatonic delusions? Do you see what I mean? The question, what is reality, is, in the end, unanswerable. We all must accept at some point what we see and are told, and live by a set of untested and untestable assumptions. I ask you to accept the set I gave you this morning because... Sitting here in the computer room, where you cannot see me, my world picture tells me that they are the true set. On the other hand, you could believe that I'm deluding myself, that there's nothing in the pink cube I see, and that you're a spear carrier in my dream. Does that make you more comfortable? No, he mumbled, ashamed of himself. I see what you mean. Even if I am crazy, it would be more comfortable to go along with it than to keep fighting it. Perfect, Mr. Fingal. If you need further illustrations, you could imagine yourself locked in a straitjacket. Perhaps there are technicians laboring right now to correct your condition, and they're putting you through this psychodrama as a first step. Is that any more attractive? No, I guess it isn't. The point is that it's as reasonable an assumption as the set of facts I gave you this morning, but the main point is that you should behave the same whichever set is true. Do you see? To fight it in the one case will only cause you trouble, and in the other would impede the treatment. I realize I'm asking you to accept me on faith, and that's all I can give you. I believe in you, he said. Now can you start everything going again? I told you, I'm not in control of your world. In fact, it's a considerable obstacle to me, seeing as I have to talk to you in these awkward ways. But things should get going on their own, as soon as you let them. Look up. He did, and he saw the normal hum and bustle of the office. Felicia was at her desk as though nothing had happened. Nothing had. Yes, something had, after all. The tapes were scattered on the floor near his desk where they had fallen. They had unreeled in an unruly mess. He started to pick them up when he saw they weren't as messy as he had thought. They spelled out a message in coils of tape. You're back on track, it said. For three weeks, Fingal was a very good boy. His co-workers, had they been real people, might have noticed a certain standoffishness in him, and his social life at home was drastically curtailed. Otherwise, he behaved exactly as if everything around him were real. But his patience had limits. 
This had already dragged on for longer than he had expected. He began to fidget at his desk, let his mind wander. Feeding information into a computer can be frustrating, unrewarding, and eventually stultifying. He had been feeling it even before his trip to Kenya. It had been the cause of his trip to Kenya. He was 68 years old, with centuries ahead of him, and stuck in a ferromagnetic rut. Long life could be a mixed blessing when you felt boredom creeping up on you. What was getting to him was the growing disgust with his job. It was bad enough when he merely sat in a real office with 200 real people shoveling slightly unreal data into a much less than real to his senses computer. How much worse now, when he knew that the data he handled had no meaning to anyone but himself, was nothing but occupational therapy created by his mind in a computer program to keep him busy while Joshim searched for his body. For the first time in his life, he began punching some buttons for himself. Under slightly less stress, he would have gone to see a psychist, the approved and perfectly normal thing to do. Here, he knew he would only be talking to himself. He failed to perceive the advantages of such an idealized psychoanalytic process. He would never really believed that a psychist did little but listen in the first place. He began to change his own life when he became irritated with his boss. She pointed out to him that his error index was on the rise, and suggested that he shape up or begin looking for another source of employment. This enraged him. He'd been a good worker for 25 years. Why should she take that attitude when he was just not feeling himself for a week or two? Then he was angrier than ever when he thought about her being merely a projection of his own mind. Why should he let her push him around? I don't want to hear it, he said. Leave me alone. Better yet, give me a raise in salary. Fingal, she said promptly. You've been a credit to your section these last weeks. I'm going to give you a raise. Thank you. Go away. She did, by dissolving into thin air. This really made his day. He leaned back in his chair and thought about his situation for the first time since he was young. He didn't like what he saw. In the middle of his ruminations, his computer screen lit up again. Watch it, Fingal, it read. That way lies Catatonia. He took the warning seriously, but didn't intend to abuse the newfound power. He didn't see why judicious use of it now and then would hurt anything. He stretched and yawned broadly. He looked around, suddenly hating the office, with its rows of workers indistinguishable from their desks. Why not take the day off? On impulse, he got up and walked the few steps to Felicia's desk. Why don't we go to my house and make love? he asked her. She looked at him with astonishment, and he grinned. She was almost as surprised as when he had hurled the tapes at her. Is this a joke? In the middle of the day? You have a job to do, you know. You want to get us fired? He shook his head slowly. That's not an acceptable answer. She stopped and rewound from that point. He heard her repeat her last sentences backwards. Then she smiled. Sure, why not? She said. Felicia left afterwards in the same slightly disconcerting way as Boss had left earlier, by melting into the air. Fingal sat quietly on his bed, wondering what to do with himself. He felt he was getting off to a bad start if he intended to edit his world with care. The telephone rang. You're damn right, said a woman's voice, obviously irritated with him. He sat up straight. Apollonia? Miss Joshim to you, Fingal. I can't talk long. This is quite a strain on me, but listen to me, and listen hard. Your navel is very deep, Fingal. From where you're standing, it's a pit. I can't even see the bottom of it. If you fall in, I can't guarantee to pull you out. But do I have to take everything as it is? Aren't I allowed some self-improvement? Don't kid yourself. That wasn't self-improvement. That was sheer laziness. It was nothing but masturbation. And while there's nothing wrong with that, if you do it to the exclusion of all else, your mind will grow in on itself. You're in grave danger of excluding the external universe from your reality. But I thought there was no external universe for me here. Almost right. But I'm feeding you external stimuli to keep you going. Besides, it's the attitude that counts. If you never had trouble finding sexual partners, why did you feel compelled to alter the odds now? I don't know. Like you said, laziness, I guess. That's right. If you want to quit your job, feel free. If you're serious about self-improvement, there are opportunities available to you in there. Search them out. Look around you. Explore. 
but don't try to meddle in things you don't understand. I've got to go now. I'll write you a letter if I can and explain more. Wait, what about my body? Have you made any progress? Yes, they've found out how it happened. It seems... Her voice faded out, and he switched off the phone. The next day, he received a letter explaining what was known so far. It seemed that the mix-up had resulted from the visit of the teacher to the medico section on the day of his recording, more specifically the return of the little boy after the others had left. They were sure now that he had tampered with the routing card that told the attendants what to do with Fingal's body. Instead of moving it to the slumber room, which was the green card, they had sent it somewhere, no one knew where yet, for a sex change, which was a blue card. The medico, in her haste to get home for her date, had not noticed the switch. Now the body could be in any of several thousand medico shops in Luna. They were looking for it, and for the boy. Fingal put the letter down and did some hard thinking. Jochum had said there were opportunities for him in the memory banks. She also said that not everything he saw was his own projections. He was receiving, was capable of receiving external stimuli. Why was that? Because he would tend to randomize without them or some other reason? He wished the letter had gone into that. In the meantime, what did he do? Suddenly, he had it. He wanted to learn about computers. He wanted to know what made them tick, to feel a sense of power over them. It was particularly strong when he thought about being a virtual prisoner inside one. He was like a worker on an assembly line. All day long he labors, taking small parts off a moving belt and installing them on larger assemblies. One day he happens to wonder who put the parts on the belt. Where do they come from? How are they made? What happens after he installs them? He wondered why he hadn't thought of it before. The administrator's office of the Lunar People's Technical School was crowded. He was handed a form and told to fill it out. It looked bleak. The spaces for previous experience and aptitude scores were almost blank when he was through with them. All in all, not a very promising application. He went to the desk and handed the form to the man sitting at the terminal. The man fed it into the computer, which promptly decided that Fingal had no talent for being a computer repair person. He started to turn away when his eye was caught by a large poster behind the man. It had been there on the wall when he came in, but he hadn't read it. Luna needs computer technicians. This means you, Mr. Fingal. Are you dissatisfied with your present employment? Do you feel you were cut up for better things? Then today may be your lucky day. You've come to the right place, and if you grasp this golden opportunity, you will find doors opening that were closed to you. Act, Mr. Fingal. This is the time. Who's to check up on you? Just take the stylist and fill in the application any old way you want. Be grandiose. Be daring. The fix is in, and you're on your way to big money. The secretary saw nothing unusual in Fingal's coming to the desk a second time, and didn't even blink when the computer decided he was eligible for the accelerated course. It wasn't easy at first. He really did have little aptitude for electronics. But aptitude is a slippery thing. His personality matrix was as flexible now as it would ever be. A little effort in the right time would go a long way toward self-improvement. What he kept telling himself was that everything that made him what he was was etched into the tiny cube wired into the computer, and if he was careful, he could edit it. Not radically, Jochum told him in a long, helpful letter later in the week. That way led to complete disruption of the FPNA matrix in catatonia, which in this case would be distinguishable from death only to a hair splitter. He thought a lot about death as he dug into the books. He was in a strange position. The being known as Fingal would not die in any conceivable outcome of this adventure. For one thing, his body was going towards a sex change, and it was hard to imagine what would happen to it that would kill it. Whoever had custody of it now would be taking care of it just as well as the medicos in the slumber room would have. If Jochum was unsuccessful in her attempt to wake him, aware and sane in the memory bank, he would merely awake and remember nothing from the time he fell asleep on the table. If, by some compounded unlikelihood, his body was allowed to die, he had an insurance recording safe in the vault of his bank. 
the recording was three years old. He would awaken in a newly grown clone body, knowing nothing of the last three years, and would have a fantastic story to listen to as he was brought up to date. But none of that mattered to him. Humans are a time-binding species, existing in an eternal now. The future flows through them and becomes the past. But it is always the present that counts. The Fingal of three years ago was not the Fingal in the memory bank. The simple fact about immortality by memory recording was that it was a poor solution. The three-dimensional cross-section that was the Fingal of now must always behave as if the, his life depended on his actions, for he would feel the pain of death if it happened to him. It was small consolation to a dying man to know that he would go on several years younger and less wise. If Fingal lost out here, he would die, because with memory recording he was three people, one who lived now, one lost somewhere on Luna, and the one potential person in the bank vault. They were really no more than close relatives. Everyone knew this, but it was so much better than the alternative that few people rejected it. They tried not to think about it, and were generally successful. They had recordings made as often as they could afford them. They heaved a sigh of relief as they got onto the table to have another recording taken, knowing that another chunk of their lives was safe for all time. But they awaited the awakening nervously, dreading being told it was now twenty years later because they had died some time after the recording and had to start all over. A lot can happen in twenty years. The person in the new clone body might have to cope with a child he or she had never seen, a new spouse or the shattering news that his or her employment was now the function of a machine. So Fingal took Jotram's warning seriously. Death was death, and though he could cheat it, death still had the last laugh. Instead of taking your whole life from you, death now only claimed a percentage, but in many ways it was the most important percentage. He enrolled in classes. Whenever possible, he took the ones that were available over the phone lines so he needn't stir from his room. He ordered his food and supplies by phone, and paid his bills by looking at them and willing them out of existence. It could have been intensely boring, or it could have been wildly interesting. After all, it was a dream world, and who doesn't think of retiring into fantasy from time to time? Fingal certainly did, but firmly suppressed the idea when it came. He intended to get out of this dream. For one thing, he missed the company of other people. He waited for weekly letters from Apollonia, she now allowed him to call her by her first name, with a consuming passion and devoured every word. His file of such letters bulged. At lonely moments, he would pull one out at random and read it again and again. On her advice, he left the apartment regularly and stirred around more or less at random. During these outings, he had wild adventures, literally. Apollonia hurled the external stimuli at him during these times, and they could be anything from the mummy's curse to Custer's last stand with the original cast. It beat hell out of the movies. He would just walk down the public corridors and open a door at random. Behind it might be King Solomon's Mines or the Sultan's Harem. He endured them all stoically. He was unable to get any pleasure from sex. He knew it was a one-handed exercise, and it took all the excitement away. His only pleasure came in his studies. He read everything he could about computer science and came to stand at the head of his class. And as he learned, it began to occur to him to apply his knowledge to his own situation. He began seeing things around him that had been veiled before. Patterns. The reality was starting to seep through his illusions. Every so often he would look up and see the faintest shadow of the real world of electron flow and fluttering circuits he inhabited. It scared him at first. He asked Apollonia about it on one of his dream journeys, this time to Coney Island in the mid-20th century. He liked it there. He could lie on the sand and talk to the surf. Overhead, a skywriter plane spelled out the answers to his questions. He studiously ignored the brontosaurus rampaging through the roller coaster off to his right. What does it mean, O oh goddess of transistoria, when I begin to see circuit diagrams on the walls of my apartment? Overwork? It means the illusion is beginning to wear thin, the plane spelled out over the next half hour. You're adapting to the reality you've been denying. It could be trouble, but we're hot on the trail of your body. We should have it soon and get you out of there. 
This had been too much for the plane. The sun was down now, the brontosaurus vanquished, and the plane out of gas. It spiraled into the ocean, and the crowd surged closer to the water to watch the rescue. Fingal got up and went back to the boardwalk. There was a huge billboard. He laced his fingers behind his back and read it. Sorry for the delay. As I was saying, we're almost there. Give us a few months. One of our agents thinks he will be at the right medico shop in about one week's time. From there, it should go quickly. For now, avoid those places where you see the circuit showing through. They're no good for you. Take my word for it. Fingal avoided the circuits as long as he could. He finished his first courses in computer science and enrolled in the intermediate section. Six months rolled by. His studies got easier and easier. His reading speed was increasing phenomenally. He found that it was more advantageous for him to see the library as composed of books instead of tapes. He could take a book from the shelf, flip through it rapidly, and know everything that was in it. He knew enough now to realize that he was acquiring a facility to interface directly with a stored knowledge in the computer, bypassing his senses entirely. The books he held in his hands were merely the sensual analogs of the proper terminals to touch. Apollonia was nervous about it, but let him go on. He breezed through the intermediate and graduated to the advanced classes. But he was surrounded by wires. Everywhere he turned, in the patterns of veins beneath the surface of a man's face, in the plate of french fries he ordered for lunch, in his palm prints, overlaying the apparent disorder of a head of blonde hair in the pillow beside him, wires were analogs of analogs. There was little in a modern computer that consisted of wires. Most of it was made of molecular circuits that were either embedded in a crystal lattice or photographically reproduced on a chip of silicon. Visually, they were hard to imagine, so his mind was making up these complex circuit diagrams that served the same purpose but could be experienced directly. One day, he could resist it no longer. He was in the bathroom, on the traditional place for the pondering of the imponderable. His mind wandered, speculating on the necessity of moving his bowels, wondering if he might safely eliminate the need to eliminate. His toe idly traced out the pathway of a circuit board incorporated in the pattern of tiles on the floor. The toilet began to overflow, not with water, but with coins. Bells were ringing rapidly. He jumped up and watched in amusement as his bathroom filled with money. He became aware of a subtle alteration in the tone of the bells. They changed from the merry clang of jackpot to the tolling of a death knell. He hastily looked around for a manifestation. He knew that Apollonia would be angry. She was. Her hand appeared and began to write on the wall. This time the writing was in his blood. It dripped menacingly from the words. What are you doing? The hand wrote, and having read, moved on. I told you to leave the wires alone. Do you know what you've done? You may have wiped the financial records from Kenya. It could take months to straighten them out. But what do I care, he exploded. What have they done for me lately? It's incredible that they haven't located my body by now. It's been a full year. The hand bunched up in a fist. Then it grabbed him around the throat and squeezed hard enough to make his eyes bulge out. It slowly relaxed. When Fingal could see straight, he backed wearily away from it. The hand fidgeted nervously, drummed its fingers on the floor. It went to the wall again. Sorry, it wrote. I guess I'm getting tired. Hold on. He waited, more shaken than he remembered being since his odyssey began. There's nothing like a dose of pain, he reflected, to make you realize that it can happen to you. The wall with the words of blood slowly dissolved into a heavenly panorama. As he watched, clouds streamed by his vantage point, and mixed beautifully with golden rays of sunshine. He heard organ music from pipes the size of sequoias. He wanted to applaud. It was so overdone, and yet so convincing. In the center of the whirring mass of white mist, an angel faded in. She had wings and a halo, but lacked the traditional white robe. She was nude and hair floated around her as if she were underwater. She levitated to him, walking on the billowing clouds, and handed him two stone tablets. He tore his eyes away from the apparition and glanced down at the tablets. Thou shalt not screw around with things thou dost not understand. 
All right, I promise I won't, he told the angel. Apollonia, is that you? Really you, I mean? Read the commandments, Fingal. This is hard on me. He looked back at the tablets. Thou shalt not meddle in the hardware systems of the Kenya Corporation, for Kenya shall not hold him indemnifiable who taketh freedoms with its property. Thou shalt not explore the limits of thy prison, trust in the Kenya Corporation to extract thee. Thou shalt not program. Thou shalt not worry about the location of thy body, for it has been located, help is on the way, the cavalry has arrived, and all is in hand. Thou shalt meet a tall, handsome stranger who will guide thee from thy current plight. Thou shalt stay tuned in for further developments. He looked up and was happy to see that the angel was still there. I won't, I promise. But where is my body, and why is it taking so long to find it? Can you? Know thou that appearing like this is a great taxation upon me, Mr. Fingal. I am undergoing strains the nature of which I have not time to reveal to thee. Hold thy horses, wait it out, and thou shalt soon see the light at the end of the tunnel. Wait, don't go! She was already starting to fade out. I cannot tarry. But, Apollonia, this is charming, but why do you appear to me in these crazy ways? Why all the pomp and circumstance? What's wrong with letters? She looked around her at the clouds, the sunbeams, the tablets in his hand, and at her body, as if seeing them for the first time. She threw back her head and laughed like a symphony orchestra. It was almost too beautiful for Fingal to bear. Me, she said, dropping the angelic bearing. Me? I didn't pick him, Fingal. I told you. It's your head, and I'm just passing through. She arched her eyebrows at him. And really, sir, I had no idea you felt this way about me. Is it puppy love? And she was gone, except for the grin. The grin haunted him for days. He was disgusted with himself about it. He hated to see a metaphor overworked so. He decided his mind was just an inept analogizer. But everything had its purpose. The grin forced him to look at his feelings. He was in love, hopelessly, ridiculously, just like a teenager. He got out all his old letters from her and read through them again, searching for the magic words that could have inflicted this on him. Because it was silly. He never met her except under highly figurative circumstances. The one time he had seen her, most of what he saw was the product of his own mind. There were no clues in the letters. Most of them were as impersonal as textbooks, though they tended to be rather chatty. Friendly, yes, but intimate, poetic, insightful, revealing? No. He failed utterly to put them together in any way that would add up to love or even a teenage crush. He attacked his studies with renewed vigor, awaiting the next communication. Weeks dragged by with no word. He called the post office several times, placed personal advertisements in every periodical he could think of, took to scrawling messages on public buildings, sealed notes in bottles and flushed them down in the disposal, rented billboards, bought television time, he screamed at the empty walls of his apartment, buttonholed strangers, tapped Morse code on the water pipes, started rumors on Skid Row tap rooms, had leaflets published and distributed all over the solar system. He tried every medium he could think of and could not contact her. He was alone. He considered the possibility that he had died. In his present situation, it might be hard to tell for sure, he abandoned it as untestable. That line was hazy enough already, without his efforts to determine which side of the life-death dichotomy he inhabited. Besides, the more he thought of existing as nothing more than kinks in a set of macromolecules plugged into a data system, the more it frightened him. He'd survived this long by avoiding such thoughts. His nightmares moved in on him, set up housekeeping in his apartment. They were a severe disappointment. He confirmed his conclusion that his imagination was not as vivid as it might be. They were infantile boogeymen, the sort that might scare him when glimpsed hazily through the fog of a nightmare, but were almost laughable when exposed to the full light of consciousness. There was a large, talkative snake that was crudely put together, fashioned from the incomplete picture a child might have of a serpent. A toy company could have done a better job. There was a werewolf whose chief claim of dread 
was a tendency to shed all over Fingal's rugs. There was a woman who consisted mostly of breasts and genitals, left over from his adolescence, he suspected. He groaned in embarrassment every time he looked at her. If he had ever been that infantile, he would rather have left the dirty traces of it buried forever. He kept booting them from the corridor, but they drifted in at night like poor relations. They talked incessantly and always about him. The things they knew. They seemed to have a very low opinion of him. The snake often expressed the opinion that Fingal would never amount to anything because he had so docilely accepted the results of the aptitude tests he took as a child. That hurt, but the best solve for the wound was further study. Finally, a letter came. He winced as soon as he got it open. The salutation was enough to tell him that he wasn't going to like it. Dear Mr. Fingal, I won't apologize for the delay this time. It seems that most of my manifestations have included an apology, and I feel I deserve a rest this time. I can't always be on call. I have a life of my own. I understand that you have behaved in an exemplary manner since I last talked with you. You have ignored the inner workings of the computer just as I told you to. I haven't been completely frank with you, and I will explain my reasons. The hookup between you and your computer is, and always has been, two-way. Our greatest fear at this end had been that you would begin interfering with the workings of the computer, to the great discomfort of everyone, or that you would go mad and run amok, perhaps wrecking the entire data system. We installed you in the computer as a humane necessity, because you would have died if we had not done so, though it would have cost you only two days of memories. But Kenya is in the business of selling memories, and holds them to be a sacred trust. It was a mix-up on the part of the Kenya Corporation that got you here in the first place, so we decided we should do everything we could for you. But it was a great hazard to our operations at this end. Once, about six months ago, you got tangled in the weather control sector of the computer and set off a storm over Kilimanjaro that is still not fully under control. Several animals were lost. I've had to fight the board of directors to keep you online, and several times the program was almost terminated. You know what that means. Now I've leveled with you. I wanted to from the start, but the people who own things around here were worried that you might start fooling around out of a spirit of vindictiveness if you knew these facts, so they were kept from you. You could still do a great deal of damage before we could shut you off. I'm laying it on the line now, with directors chewing their nails over my shoulder. Please stay out of trouble. On to the other matter. I was afraid from the outset that what has happened might happen. For over a year, I've been your only contact with the outside world. I've been the only other person in your universe. I would have to be an extremely cold, hateful, awful person, which I am not, for you not to feel affection for me under these circumstances. You are suffering from intense sensory deprivation, and it's well known that someone in that state becomes pliable, suggestible, and lonely. You've attached your feelings to me as the only thing around worth caring for. I've tried to avoid intimacy with you for that reason, to keep things firmly on a last-name basis. But I relented during one of your periods of despair, and you read into my letters some things that were not there. Remember, even in the printed medium, it is your mind that controls what you see. Your sensor has let through what it wanted to see, and maybe even added some things of its own. I'm at your mercy. For all I know, you may be reading this letter as a passionate affirmation of love. I've added every reinforcement I know of to make sure the message comes through on a priority channel and is not garbled. I'm sorry to hear that you love me. I do not, repeat, do not love you in return. You'll understand why, at least in part, when you get out of there. It will never work, Mr. Fingal. Give it up. Apollonia Jochum Fingal graduated first in his class. He had finished the required courses for his degree during the last long week after his letter from Apollonia. It was a bitter victory for him, marching up to the stage to accept the sheepskin, but he clutched it to him fiercely. At least he had made the most of the situation. At least he had not meekly let the wheels of the machine chew him up like a good worker. 
He reached out to grasp the hand of the college president and saw it transformed. He looked up and saw the bearded, robed figure flow and writhe and become a tall, uniformed woman. With a surge of joy, he knew who it was. Then the joy became ashes in his mouth, which he hurriedly spit out. I always knew you'd joke on a figure of speech, she said, laughing tiredly. You're here, he said. He could not quite believe it. He stared dully at her, grasping her hand and the diploma with equal tenacity. She was tall, as the prophecy had said, and handsome. Her hair was cropped short over a capable face, and the body beneath the uniform was muscular. The uniform was open at the throat and wrinkled. There were circles under her eyes, and the eyes were bloodshot. She swayed slightly on her feet. I'm here, all right. Are you ready to go back? She turned to the assembled students. How about it, gang? Do you think he deserves to go back? The crowd went wild, cheering and tossing mortarboards in the air. Fingal turned dazedly to look at them, with a dawning realization. He looked down at the diploma. I don't know, he said. I don't know. Back to work at the data room? She clapped him on the back. No, I promise you that. But how could it be different? I've come to think of this piece of paper as something real. Real! How could I have deluded myself like that? Why did I accept it? I helped you along, she said. But it wasn't all a game. You really did learn all the things you learned. It won't go away when you return. That thing in your hand is imaginary for sure, but who do you think prints the real ones? You're registered where it counts, in the computer, as having passed all the courses. You'll get a real diploma when you return. Fingal wavered. There was a tempting vision in his head. He'd been here for over a year and had never really exploited the nature of the place. Maybe that business about dying in the memory bank was all a shuck. Another lie invented to keep him in his place. In that case, he could remain here and satisfy his wildest desires, become king of the universe with no opposition, wallow in pleasure no emperor ever imagined. Anything he wanted here, he could have. Anything at all. And he really felt he might pull it off. He noticed many things about this place, and now had the knowledge of computer technology to back him up. He could squirm around and evade their attempts to erase him, even survive if they removed the cue by programming himself into other parts of the computer. He could do it. With a sudden insight, he realized that he had no desires wild enough to keep him here in his navel. He had only one major desire now, and she was slowly fading out. A lap dissolves, replacing her with the old college president. Coming? she asked. Yes. It was as simple as that. The stage, president, students, and auditorium faded out, and the computer room at Kenya faded in. Only Apollonia remained constant. He held onto her hand until everything stabilized. Whew, she said, and reached around behind her head. She pulled out a wire from her occipital plug and collapsed into a chair. Someone pulled a similar wire from Fingal's head, and he was finally free of the computer. Apollonia reached for a steaming cup of coffee on the table, littered with empty cups. You are a tough nut, she said. For a minute, I thought you'd stay. It happened once. You're not the first to have this happen to you, but you're no more than the 20th. It's an unexplored area. Dangerous. Really, he said. You weren't just saying that? <laughs> no, she laughed. Now the truth can be told. It is dangerous. No one ever survived more than three hours in that kind of a cube hooked into a computer. You went for six. You do have a strong world picture. She was watching him to see how he reacted to this. She was not surprised to see him accept it readily. <sighs> I should have known that, he said. I should have thought of it. It was only six hours out here, and more than a year for me. Computers think faster. Why didn't I see that? I helped you not see it, she admitted. Like the push, I gave you not to question why you were studying so hard. Those two orders worked a lot better than some of the others I gave you. She yawned again, and it seemed to go on forever. See, 
It was pretty hard for me to interface with you for six hours straight. No one's ever done it before. It can get to be quite a strain. So we both got something to be proud of. She smiled at him, but it faded when he did not return it. Don't look so hurt, Fingal. What is your first name? I knew it, but erased it early in the game. Does it matter? I don't know. Surely you must see why I haven't fallen in love with you, though you may be a perfectly lovable person. I haven't had time. It's been a very long six hours, but it was still only six hours. What can I do? Fingal's face was going through awkward changes as he absorbed that. Things were not so bleak after all. You could go to dinner with me. I'm already emotionally involved with someone else. I should warn you of that. You could still go to dinner. You haven't been exposed to my new determination. I'm going to really make a case. She laughed warmly and got up. She took his hand. You know, it's possible that you might succeed. Just don't put wings on me again, all right? You'll never get anywhere like that. I promise. I'm through with visions for the rest of my life. End of Overdrawn at the Memory Bank by John Varley. This story was read from the collection The Persistence of Vision by John Varley, published by The Dial Press and James Wade. Copyright 1978 by John Varley. This story was read to you by Augustine Hart. Thank you for listening.